Good morning, Centerville Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School. I'm so pleased to see you all here today. We have a great program planned for you. We've got wonderful Sabbath schools. We've got uh, our wonderful people on live stream that are joining us from afar. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our Sabbath school. You are in the right place at the right time on the right day. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we are blessed to still have freedom to worship per our conscience. And we are glad to be here this morning in the house of the Lord. And we ask, Father, for a signal blessing from you. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The name of my talk this morning is, There is Beauty in the Journey, Traveling the Difficult Way Which Leads to Life. We, we talk so much of hardships and toil and turmoil and, and suffering. And I don't want to make light of any of that. It's all a part of the journey, truthfully, whether you're saved or lost. It's just tough sometimes. But we don't talk about the beauty. We just leave that off somehow. We, we leave the beauty off. So our kind of key text this morning is from Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. I hope that's large enough to read. I tried to make it bigger this time. It still looks maybe a little small. But verse 13, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few, few, who find it. Now this word difficult, where I have the asterisk, can be defined in a number of different ways. It can mean difficult. It can also mean confined. Like just, you're, you're kind of stuck. Tight. It's restrictive. It's narrow. Or even rugged. That's the narrow, straight path. As compared to the, the broad, wide path. Luke 17, 24 tells us, Strive. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. But today you can seek to enter and you are able. You are able to this day find the narrow gate. And we're to strive to do so. It's not a passing interest. It's something we must do. Testimonies, volume 1, page 127. She talks about these two roads, these two ways. She says, these roads are distinct. They are separate in opposite directions. One leads to eternal life, the other to eternal death. The roads are opposite. One is broad and smooth, the other narrow and rugged. So the parties that travel them are opposite in character. They are opposite in life. They are opposite in dress. They are opposite in conversation. Opposite means not the same. You understand? Different. This summer, family, Wendy and Austin and I anyway, we went to Medicine Bow National Forest in Wyoming and I had such a rich spiritual experience hiking there. And we're going to combine that experience with this and draw some wonderful spiritual lessons. So first of all, I want to show you a picture of the broad, smooth road. There it is, right? Whoops, you know what I have to do? I have to do this. That really helps, doesn't it? That's the broad, smooth road. And you can see cars are just waiting to go on it, just ready to go. That's the narrow road. Can you see the difference? Now I'm telling you, these are at opposite ends of the same parking lot. Totally the same place. Which one looks more attractive initially? Huh? I think the broad road looks pretty good right there. It's well paved, it's nice, smooth. And this one, I don't know, there's a dead tree there. And just maybe not looking as good. But there's beauty in the journey. But our journey starts here. 
Now, I'm not trying to be crude or crass or, or in any way, you know, bad here. But it's something that we don't talk about. Life is messy. And when you get involved in people's lives, you begin to realize that there's just stuff. And it's not pretty at all. And that's why the first message of Christ, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the repentance station. You just have to leave some things off before you begin the journey. It's just a part of life. You've got to do it. Whether it's internal baggage, external baggage, there's a place here for both. The journey starts here. You must repent. Testimonies, Volume 128. I saw many traveling in this broad road who had the words written upon them. Dead to the world. The end of all things is at hand. Be also ready. They looked just like the vain ones all around them. Except a shade of sadness which I noticed upon their countenances. Their conversation was just like that of the gay, thoughtless ones around them, but they would occasionally point with great satisfaction to the letters on their garments, calling others to have the same on theirs. They were in the broad way, yet they possessed, professed to be of the number who were traveling the narrow way. Those around them would say, there is no distinction between us. We are alike. We dress and talk and act alike. That's not the narrow way. Now, because of time, I have to skip a few things. So we're going to skip through the talking and acting. But uh, I will say that once you get just a little bit into the trail, it becomes quite beautiful. Because there's beauty in the journey. Let me go through here. It's just gorgeous. You just get up a little bit on that trail. And, and the, the narrow road is never boring. Never. There is always something interesting. Something beautiful to see. It may be perilous, but it's not boring. But when I'm on the Broadway, I can fall asleep driving my car. Have you ever, like, you know, I know you have. You don't have to answer me. I already know the answer. Now, there are these things on the trail called rock cairns because the trail is rugged. It's rocky. It's steep. It's, it's rough. And it's easy to get lost on the trail. It's not always well marked. So they put these things. They're, they're called cairns, but these are called rock cairns. Right here you can see it. And this one has a stick coming up out of it because so much of the trail... Even just the natural pile of rocks looked like rock cairns, so they put a stick in these. That's not really normal for rock cairns to have these sticks, but on this trail it was necessary because it was just so look-alike. So, so these rock cairns are all along the trail so that you can figure out where you need to go. And do you know that God has rock cairns? He totally does. Ten of them. You shall have no other gods before him. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, steal, bear false witness. You, you shall not covet. So as you're going along the narrow path, if you try to get off of that, you're going to bump up against these rock cairns. It's not the right way. You're not supposed to steal that paint out of the drugstore. You're not supposed to lie to your mom. You're not supposed to, whatever, covet that car that your neighbor just got, and that's the one you want. So you're going to bump into these rock cairns all along the narrow journey. Because these are God's rock cairns. You're going to know when you're getting off the path. Those who travel in the narrow way are t talking of the joy and happiness they will have at the end of the journey. Their countenances are often sad, yet often beam with a holy, sacred joy. We don't talk about that holy, sacred joy. We just talk about, oh, it's so sad. No, there's holy, sacred joy. A pattern has been given them. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief opened that road for them and traveled it himself. His followers see his footsteps and are comforted and cheered. He went through safely. So can they if they follow in his footsteps. 
Now, there were times that the trail was nothing but a small stream. This is the trail. Is it really a trail? Looks like a stream. I don't want to walk in there, get my shoes muddy. We weren't even sure if we were on the trail. Is this really it? But then we would see something, a footprint. And we would truly be cheered. <laughs> we knew we were on the path. Someone has gone ahead of us, left that, you know, little marker for us. And so we see the steps of Jesus all along the narrow path. He has been here. We can rest in that. This is the way. This is the way. But, you know, discerning the trail could be tricky. So down here at the bottom of this uh, picture, this is the trail. Can you pick the trail out of that? It's kind of tough, isn't it? If you're not in tune with the journey, if you're not in tune with the trail, this just looks like a bunch of rocks. But after you've been on the trail for a while, you can begin to see the subtle differences between the truth and not the truth. You can see the subtle differences between the trail that Christ has tread before you and the ones that aren't. So you can see on the side here, these rocks are kind of bigger. That's, that's pretty obviously not the trail. You got some chunks here, it's not the trail. But if you look carefully through here, these rocks are a little bit smoother just a little bit more packed down. But if you weren't in tune, you wouldn't even know to look. Difficult to discern. Now, at one point, my lovely wife, Wendy, she got off the trail, and she actually slipped and fell. She didn't hurt herself, at least not on this trail. Another trail she slipped and fell and really did hurt herself, but not on this trail. So I want you to understand that it's normal for you to kind of get off the trail it's not unusual to slip and fall. And that's why this verse in the Bible exists. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. Hallelujah. He comes up again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. So if you fall while you're on the journey on the narrow path, just get up. Just get up. It's okay. You're still on the journey. Counsels to uh, parents, teachers, and students, page 490. God's purpose for us is that we shall ever move upward. What way? So if you fall, you're not sure where the trail is, what direction do you go? Up. It's not that hard. When you fall or are unsure of the path, you know one thing for sure, the path is upwards. Get up and keep moving upwards. You're still on the journey. You're not cast off. God's not going to fry you because you fell. And we need to get that right in our heads. You don't punish your kid when they're learning to walk and they fall down. You just don't do that. You encourage them. You console them. It's an important lesson. Now, sometimes the view is obscured. We couldn't hardly see anything. It's easier even on a, a rugged trail when you can see everything laid out before you. There's the peak. There's the next 16 rock cairns. I can see the trail. It's nice. It's still rugged, but I can at least see it. But that's just not reality, people. Sometimes you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Have you ever been in that situation? I have. I've been in that situation. I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from. You can't see much of anything. And in these times, you must look a little harder and you have to trust a little bit more. And almost always, we were able to find a rock cairn to the next place. Right here, you can kind of see it. I have the arrow. You can just barely make it out, but you can't see beyond that. So you travel to that one. And when you get there and you seek, there's the next one. That's all you can see is the next one. Just barely, but you can see it. And then you go to that one. And when you get there, you look, there's the next one. And so it is. When the Israelites were up against the Red Sea, what did God say? Go through. Go through. Take the step. You got to do that, people. Walk the way you know. And when you get to the next place, more will be given to you. 
But if you don't go to that next place, God has no reason to give you more. None. Then you finally get to the top, and you don't get this kind of view from the Broadway. It's a deception on the Broadway. But there's something about the top of a mountain and the view you see, it's incredible. It's just, you're inspired because you're a speck. A speck. Yet you're on top. It's really incredible. But there's trouble ahead. A mountain climber friend of mine who's, who's done all the major peaks in the United States, he told me once, he climbed Mount Denali, and that's the highest point in North America. It's in Alaska. Some of you might have known it as Mount McKinley, but they've changed the name now um, in respect to the Native Americans. And that's a very difficult climb. It's a technical climb. It's just, it's not for everybody for sure. But he told me once that on Mount Denali, more people die coming down off the mountain than climbing the mountain. They're much more careful to get up. And when they get there, it's like, oh, we've done it. Yay. And then they become careless. They lose their diligence. And they think that they've done some great thing. And so coming down, they fall into some crevice or whatever, and they die. Many more deaths coming down than going up. We must always be diligent. The journey is not over when you reach the top of the mountain. The journey is not over when you have that mountaintop experience with Jesus. You're still not there. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Oh, I'm telling you people, we were at the top of this mountain. We had done everything right. And here's an obvious and clear sign. What does that say to you? It says, go that way. It's pretty simple. There's the sign. And you look that way, and guess what? There's this wonderfully, clearly marked, very obvious, so oh, I have to do that. You see that sign? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. And here's the rock, Karen. It's got wires, this big plastic thing, all these rocks piled up. You can't miss it. There is no way you can miss it. It's amazingly marked. And they're right next to each other. We have the sure word of God that tells us. Looks are deceiving. Now, I know this is a little bit of an eyesore. But right here is that sign. See the little arrow? You see this yellow thing here? That's my wife. And she looked over that way, and literally it looked like a sheer cliff drop-off. So we thought, oh, that's just some overlook point that they're pointing out or whatever. Austin, I don't know, he's wandering around in the wilderness over here somewhere. Wendy looks at this sign. Instead of going that way, she goes over here to the left. And I just follow her because that's, that's what husbands do. They follow their wives. And, and the deceptions back here, you see all these little sticks poking up? They sort of look like our rock herons. They're deceitful. Very deceitful. Now, our guidebook, we had one, hiking in the Medicine Bow area, whatever it was called. And it said, there's an old telegraph trail here with these poles. It makes the trail confusing. Don't follow them. They'll take you to another place. Don't do it. There it was. We looked at the sign. We looked at the poles. And guess where we went? We went to the poles. We didn't believe the obvious, even though we were on top of the mountain. So ridiculous. Whoops, after a while, we found our way again. It sort of all dawned on us at the same time, even though we were sort of different areas on the top of that mountain. Um, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, that sign kind of meant what it said. We probably should have taken a closer look. So uh, had we obeyed the obvious direction instead of the way that seems right, we would have stayed on the trail. But instead, we're climbing across all these silly boulders. But we found our way again, and the beauty continues. Once back on the narrow way, it was still cold, it was still windy, but the path became flatter, a little less rugged, and we were rewarded with so many beautiful vistas. So many. And when you have your morning devotions, and you're in tune with the Word of God, do you not see day after day wonderful and beautiful things out of the Word of God that just inspire you? Every day on the journey, you can have that experience. 
And so we did, <coughs> even here. Let's see, I'm going to skip these. I love this verse, Isaiah 30, 21. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. See, God knows that you're on that narrow path and that you might have struggles. So if you try to veer off, he's going to say, this is the way, walk in it. Or if you go the other way, this is the way, walk in it. It's a difficult trail. The narrow road is often rugged and unforgiving, and life has its challenges. That's just reality. Sometimes the way forward is simply forward, period. Right? You may learn that you're more than what you've become, and with God's help, you can do more than you ever thought you could. How many of you today go back to your high school years and think about what you thought about then, what your future was like, and look where you are now? How many of you would have ever said, I would have never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would be where I am today. Anybody? I mean, I wouldn't have. God is amazing. There is beauty in the journey. It's beautiful that God does these things. Now, I can't hardly read that myself, but this was the trail. Rocks at a 45 degree angle, they're big rocks, and you had to you know, you really had to kind of think about where your feet were going, where you're placing your hands, because if you didn't do it right, you were going to fall. If you fell forward, you'd hit the rocks, it would hurt. If you fell backwards, you'd fall backwards into the lake, you'd get wet. So you're going to get wet, or you're going to get hurt, you're going to get both. But God says, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the trail. The way forward is forward. You can do it if God tells you. His, his commands are promises. You can do it. If the command is forward, then it's forward. Period. Now beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, be in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the word of God, like what we did on top of the mountain. This next part's the key part. But exhort one another, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This exhortation is really important in the church. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So we've got to finish the journey, and we're told to exhort one another, which means to kind of encourage one another. Now, this is a different trail some time ago, Mount Elbert. And this is where I stopped. And guess what I could see? This is the peak but I couldn't get there. I was spent. My heart was racing. I was worn out. My legs were aching. I couldn't breathe. So I just stopped. Backpack on. I brought too much stuff. My wife. I was weighing about 180, 190 at this point in my life. What do you weigh? Maybe 100 pounds, 105, something like that. She's nothing. She's a waif. She wanted me to finish that climb. And do you know what she did? She took my pack and her pack. And she climbed the rest of the way with two packs so I could make it to the top. There's beauty in the journey. She didn't have to do that. That's not justice. That's mercy. That's beautiful, people. I made it to the top because someone bore my burden with me. It's beautiful. Sometimes the path up is a waterfall. You ever climb a waterfall? I'm telling you, it's beautiful. It's scary. You know, you don't climb in the middle of the waterfall, obviously, but it's still wet, and you still get wet, and it's still splashing on you. And sometimes the way forward is up on a waterfall, and you know what? That's the way. The way forward is forward. This is another time I couldn't go. I couldn't. I was done. Still, I was still about 190. Different trail, different day, different year. And we had climbed this far, and that was it. My heart was racing. My face, you could just feel it flush. My pack wasn't even heavy that day. I, just, I was just done. 
You could look down. There was a beautiful pasture. Elk were grazing in it. I'll just stay here, I said. I'll stay here, and you all finish and, and come back later. I'll still be here. It'll be great. You know what they said? We're not leaving you here. My kids, my wife, come on, Dad. Let's go. They didn't take my pack this time. Wasn't that heavy. Just step at a time, Dad. Exhortation got me through. Amen. Now a message from our sponsor. <laughs> the health message. In both cases where I couldn't go forward, I was weighing about 190. I'm about 5'10-ish. My ideal weight somewhere between 150 and 155. So I'm packing an extra backpack, but it's a front pack. You know what I mean? And it matters. Once COVID hit, Wendy, I think it was really Trevor, but Wendy put us on what I call the COVID diet. It's just the true Adventist diet. It's kind of the chip diet that, you know, Tim, you were leading at one time. So I was already vegetarian, mostly vegan, but she cut out potato chips. Can you believe it? <laughs> Boxed cereal, gone. Processed foods, gone. No pasta, no, you know, everything was just fresh and wonderful, and I began to lose weight, a pound a month. And I've lost about 22 pounds just off of that. I haven't done anything but obey my wife's diet. So this last climb in Wyoming, without that extra pack on me, I had no issues, nothing. But I just want to tell you that this health message is part of the narrow way. If you want to get somewhere on the narrow path, it's important. That's all I'm saying. Now, I've got to rush through some of this here, but danger and peril are ultimately a part of the narrow way. The last place you want to be when it begins to hail and rain and lightning and thunder and the wind is blowing, the last place you want to be is on an open boulder field, but that's where I was. So this, the, the verse came to mind, Psalm 112, 7, he will not be afraid of evil tidings, his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord, because, you know, there I was. There I was. Danger, peril, it's just a part of it, people. It's just the way it is, and you better be fortified with the word of God. Now, quickly through this, we know the armor of God, right? The helmet of salvation, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, you know, all of that. That's what this, these verses are. And, you know, Wendy was ahead of me on the trail. She found shelter in the time of storm, but not Scott. Scott's like, I'll trust in God. I was a bit presumptuous. It's hailing on me, literally, getting pelted. It's raining. I had rain gear in my pack. So What? You got to put it on, buddy. So I finally catch up with Wendy. She says to me, you're one of the stupid hikers. <laughs> and she began to uh, exhort me, really rebuke me. And she was right. You got rain gear, you're not wearing it. You know you're supposed to get off the mountain as fast as you can when lightning happens. And I knew this, right? You know why she did that? Because she loves me. Period. We rebuke sometimes because we hate. But this kind of rebuke is beautiful. It's part of the beauty of the journey, and we don't do it enough in this church. We don't. Now, the journey ends one of two ways. You're either going to die... Are you going to be translated? Those are your choices. Well, I don't even know if it's a choice, right? It's, those are God's choices for you. I guess if you're living in the end of time, you might have a choice, right? Will you take the broad way or will you take the narrow way? Huh? Will you find the superficial beauty of the broad way or the natural, rugged, and true beauty of the narrow way? Will you be among the many or will you be among the few? Because the narrow, narrow is the gate and difficult the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. See this guy there? It's my son Austin. 
How many people you see on this trail? Yeah, at least two, because I had to take the picture. Wendy was right by me, so there were three, right? But that, that's not my point. The point is, is we hiked in these mountains for a week. And we did see people, but not many. Not many. Few. When I get to heaven, I want to tell God, here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Because in this life, that is for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's beautiful. There is beauty in the journey. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that there is beauty. That in trials and suffering and whatever the journey may take us through, there's constant tokens of your love, constant blessings from above, because you love us. Let us encourage one another in the way, because there is beauty in the journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Now, we have a number of Sabbath school classes. There's one here in the sanctuary. I'm assuming it was Dr. Swaggart that's teaching today, right? Elder Swaggart's teaching. We have uh, a class in behind this class, Mr. Peebles' class, the good guy. It's a wonderful class. Is there a class behind this class now? I get confused whether or not there is. Sometimes I see people there, sometimes I don't. No. Down the hall to the right, in the library, there's a class. Down the hall to the right this way, Pastor Robot's office, there's a class. So you pick where you want to go. You're going to be blessed. It doesn't matter. They're all amazing. Thank you so much for attending the remarks this morning. We'll make do, right? Um, <clears throat> remember in the old days when they used to say, how many studied their lesson seven times? <laughs> yeah. Well, I am just going to say, I expect that you all did. And so we don't need to go over every line and fill in every uh, gap in the lesson there for you. Um, I want us to study together in Sabbath school. That's a different idea. Um, I was pastoring in a little district, four churches, and I had a lady who would call me every Friday night and want me to fill in every blank for her so that when she got to Sabbath school in the morning, she'd have all the right answers. <laughs> uh, I disabused her of that told her I had a family and a sermon to prepare, so um, you know, I helped her a couple of times, but there's, there's just a point. So this is the introduction for the whole quarter. So I am not going to try to cover all 13 weeks today. Aren't you glad? Let's pray before we get into the lesson. Gracious fathers, we study your word together. We pray that you will bless us with your spirit to guide us to understand not just this lesson, but your word to take it into our hearts that we may truly follow in the way that you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I went through this lesson and I thought, what is my good friend, the author, trying to say in this lesson? What is the point of this? It seemed like a very scattered, disconnected, several days of study. All good stuff, but I couldn't 
make it gel. That's part of the reason that I'm not going to go through it page by page, um, because I needed it to make sense. And I was a high school English teacher before I was a pastor. And I just spent uh, this week being a substitute at the academy because it's senior survival this weekend, or it started Wednesday. And the faculty, well, five of them were out. So that made uh, for an interesting day. And I got, to, I got to be in algebra. And they were asking me questions about algebra. And I said, I wish I could help, but it's been 53 years since I did algebra. Um, in a little while, I began to pick up on some of the things that you have to do to figure out the problems. So I was a little tiny bit of help. But really, knowing where you're going, having the lesson plan in advance, knowing the end is really important. The idea in this overview, it's called a preamble to the book, is to, to give us a sense of where we're going at the end. Now, the title of the whole chapter is The Present Truth in the Book of Deuteronomy. So obviously, we want to find out why studying this book, this very, very old book would have any impact on our lives today. It's probably about 3,500 years old. That's pretty old. We don't study a lot of old books, even in our schools. I know of one university in this country that is based on the classics. The rest of them have abandoned studying the classics. Um, the last church we were members at in Topeka, Kansas, there was a retired colonel who taught at the War College in Leavenworth. And he told me that they still study Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars in the War College because it is such an excellent book about strategy. If you're in the War College, you're preparing to be on the general staff, you're in the command structure of the military, so you need to know how to do strategy. So they study Gallic Wars. The interesting thing about Gallic Wars is there are three sort of full-length versions of the Gallic Wars. That's all. There are three that date to about 400 years after Caesar wrote it. So these are copies of copies of copies of copies. And there are only three of them. We have thousands of copies of the scriptures that we're studying. So many that we are able to compare and scholars are able to figure out where the variations came, when they happened, when the scribe got tired and his hand is obviously sloppy with the letters and he's inserted an idea that wasn't in the text that he was copying from. All of that can be figured out. And having known all that, the Isaiah scroll found in the Qumran caves, 66 feet long. That's an incredible piece of work. You imagine trying to do that hand copying all those letters one at a time. There's less than 3% difference in the actual letters that we have in the manuscripts, in the, the text that we study from today. Amen. That's all the difference from Isaiah, 700 years before Christ to today. Less than 3% variation, and most of those are very easy to explain and, and show how it happened and what happened when you do textual criticism, the study of the text. So we need to study this text. We know it's reliable. We know it's more reliable than the ones that the world is studying to determine how to run their wars and run their governments. It was interesting, I was um, reading in Patriarchs and Prophets, and it says on page 468, since the Israelites were to be in a special sense the guardians and keepers of God's law, the significance of its precepts and the importance of obedience were to be especially impressed upon them and through them upon their children and their children's 
children. She also says, the laws which God gave his ancient people were wiser, better, and more humane than those of the most civilized nations of the earth. The laws of the nations bear the marks of the infirmities and passions of the unrenewed heart. But God's law bears the stamp of the divine. So the goal of our lesson this week is to understand why studying this book, 3,500 years after it was written, is important. How it speaks to us, how it's relevant to our lives today. And the, the point of the lesson, I believe, what I took from it, maybe I should ask it as a question, what did you take from the lesson? But I'm just going to tell you. It's easier that way. The point is, obedience is the expression of love. Obedience is the expression of love. Why does Scott follow his wife. Why did she take care of him on the mountain trails? It's an expression of love. It was when he and they disobeyed the clear signs that they got in trouble. Okay, so our Constitution has a preamble. What is the point of a preamble? Help me out. Somebody tell me, why do we have a preamble? Why does the Constitution have a preamble? Set the stage, tell the intent. It gives context. Okay, gives the context. So in this preamble to the book of Deuteronomy, this week's lesson, we are studying the context, the reason, the direction. We need to know what came before the speeches of Moses in this book. Um, scholars are divided on whether there are three or four sermons that he gives, and they are connected by... Um, explanations of what he has said in between. We call the book Deuteronomy, second giving of the law. It's 40 years after the law was first given by God on Mount Sinai and is now after the 40 years. Why was it necessary after 40 years to give the law again? Who's got a reason for that? Yes. Okay, the entire generation of those who had been standing at the mountain when God spoke his law were now dead in the wilderness. So this needed to be repeated to be impressed upon those who now stood on the borders of the promised land. They needed to know the words. The, the uh, Hebrews call it uh, Ali al-Dabar, which is the words which Moses spoke. These words. That's what it's called. These words. A little different than second law. These words. It brings us closer to the original intent. We talk about a person's last will and testimony. We could read Deuteronomy as Moses' last will and testimony. Because he, right at the opening of the book, sets aside his command position and anoints Joshua to be the one who will lead them into the promised land. Joshua was one of only two of the generation who had stood at the foot of the mountain along with Moses and heard God speak the law. There's nobody left it's an incredible thing out of the hundreds of thousands of men, not to mention the women and children. This is it. We're down to them. And here they are on the borders of the promised land. These words, the last will and testament of Moses, become extremely important. Did you know that to this day, a devoted son of Abraham a good Jew still recites an entire chapter of this book every day. 
We always think of the Shema as just one verse. Oh no, it's the entire chapter that they recite. They go back to their roots every day to these words because that formed the core. Think if we took our constitution and at least annually read through it and our Declaration of Independence. These words which establish us as a nation, as a peculiar people on the earth, as a unique nation with a special role in history. That's what Israel was, a unique people, special, with an incredible responsibility. We'll have 12 weeks to cover the contents of these 34 chapters, but I want to start where Moses started. So let's start with Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verse 8. What do we read here? Deuteronomy chapter 1. Somebody with a good, strong voice, since you don't have a microphone, the advantage I have. And let me hear that. Let us all hear that read. Chapter 1, uh, didn't I say verse 8? Yes. I did. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and their descendants after them. What are these words telling us? God keeps his promises. Okay? Does this set the context for where we are and what we're doing here today? Studying the book of Deuteronomy, listening to these words again, and these words. Moses takes the people in that day back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promise of God. What had God promised according to what was given there? What did he just say that was, they were given? The land. They're still standing in Moab. They're still standing in Moab. And he says, here it is. It's laid out before you. It's yours. Just take it. Why is that important? Had they ever been there before? <laughs> yeah. The, in this chapter, it says, this is the 11th month of the 40th year. Remember what happened 39 years and 11 months before? <laughs> they were there. And they sent in the spies. And he rehearses all this in this chapter. They sent in the spies. And the spies come back and say, let's take it. And they say, no. And then they go and try to attack the land, even though God says, don't do it. Now, don't do it. They try it anyway. They end up weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth, but that doesn't change God's decree. They have to spend a day for a year, a year for a day, in the wilderness because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. Okay, help me out. What were the covenant promises? What did he promise? Let's start with Adam. What was the covenant promise God gave to Adam? No, Genesis 3.15? What did he promise? That's part of it, but... The seed. The seed. So family becomes extremely important. You see why the Jews were so careful about their genealogies. The seed is coming through this line. And you trace the family all the way down. You get to Abraham. He's sort of a half pagan when God calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees and we get to Abraham and we get another covenant another ex well wait a minute before we get to him we've got to go by Noah what was the covenant to Noah covenant was he was not going to destroy the earth again 
he would preserve. Noah didn't have to worry about God preserving the seed. God would preserve the line. The whole world had been destroyed. There were just eight of them. It was him and his kids and their wives, and that's it. He says, you don't need to worry about that. How long? Till heaven and earth are no more. I'll take care of it. Then we get to Abraham. And he's called out of Ur of the Chaldees, makes that little detour through Haran, stays there a while, finally makes it to Canaan. He's 75 years old. He's got no kids. What happened to God's promise of the seed? Don't you think he'd be scratching his head a bit by that point? Now, I'm only in my 60s. And sometimes I scratch my head over some of the things God says. If you don't, have you been reading it? Uh, there's some strange, there are some promises that just seem absolutely outlandish in this book. And yet, like Scott pointed out, whether we can see the sense of it or not, it's what God said. Trust his word. Trust his promise. God keeps his promise. Moses took him back to those promises. So we've come to Abraham and what was the promise? Not only the land, but descendants. Yeah, God's going to take care of it. Interesting thought here. The problem comes when we try to help God. We try to help God. Yeah, Abraham had that problem, didn't he? Yeah. He tried to help God. Yeah. Um, when did Abraham receive the sign of the covenant? The sign of the covenant being circumcision. When he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? He received the promise before. And why did God give him that promise? Genesis 12 tells us Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Not Abraham obeyed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But about Abraham, he says, I've entrusted my promise to him because he obeys me. He teaches his children to obey me. So we get to Isaac. Same covenant, same promises, descendants. And like, but think about, you think about these people and all these people who are old when they have kids. Ab Abraham had to wait 25 more years from the first time God promised him a child. Whoa, that's a long time to wait. Not to mention the, the physiological facts. 100 years old and having a boy, child. Um, we have the privilege. Nah, Susan has the privilege of taking care of our grandson. He's four and a half months old now. We're in our 60s. That child wears us out. I team, team, I, I team with her sometimes. So give her a break. <laughs> he's just four and a half months. I'm afraid of when he starts crawling and running. I mean, he wears us out now. Be 100 years old and do that. <sighs> Boy, but God provides when he gives the promise. Same thing with Jacob. Land and offspring and protection. All these promises keep coming. We see the same thing as Israel in the closing chapters of the book of Genesis blesses his sons, all 12 of them, and he names out the tribes and he gives the blessings. And all of that is contained in Deuteronomy 1 verse 8 where Moses takes all those people back to that covenant promise. The promise is that God will provide. He will provide more than they could ever imagine. So we've already mentioned uh, Exodus uh, 
and here in Deuteronomy that it's the 11th month of the 40th year. So let's, uh, well, maybe we actually did this too. Verse 19. Let's hear verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 19. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all the, that great and terrible wilderness, which he saw by the way of the mountain and the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh by Nam. Way back then, just a couple of months out of Egypt, 11 days from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, and yet they spent 39 years and 11 months getting back there. Um, in the book of Numbers, there are 22 campsites listed by name where the Israelites camped. 22 in 40 years. They moved that many times. Susan and I have moved 22 times in 35 years. Ugh. There's nothing worse than moving. There's an old saw among pastors that three moves is equal to a three conference moves is equal to a fire. Um, in one of our moves, we actually had a house fire. I don't care how many conference moves you go through; nothing is as bad as a house fire. Um, but imagine these people having to pack up and move that many times. And they're not in nice places with big trucks and people to help load them up. I mean, they're carrying most of their stuff on their backs or on the backs of their animals. We're talking about tents in the wilderness. We were to Jordan a few years ago. Whew. It's described as a waste howling wilderness where the serpents helped them practice faith. <laughs> it's a nasty place. There are actually um, petroglyphs there that are as old as the Exodus. It's fascinating to see where the Israelites traveled through that area and what it was like. It's not someplace I would want to go camping or hiking. Um, we stayed in Bedouin tents out there. It was an experience. Uh, not to be missed, uh, but honestly, I don't know that I would want to repeat it, especially the way they had to. Why did they have to go back and spend all that time in the wilderness? We heard it before because of unbelief. Abraham believed and it was counted as righteousness. They had to go back into the wilderness for 40 years because of unbelief. And so that is part of the preamble to the rest of this. Why is this an important lesson for us to learn as we approach this, as we understand the great context and setting of identifying the present truth in this book? Because it really boils down to this. We're saved by grace through faith. And it's not something we can work up. It's the gift of God. The book of Deuteronomy is a book about grace. It's a book about love. And it's about love in action. Um, what is legalism? How would you define legalism? Go ahead. Obedience without relationship. Does that help everybody? Anybody got anything they want to add to that? Obedience because you want to follow the letter of the law rather than the spirit. Okay, okay because, because you want to follow the letter rather than... Is there anything wrong with following the letter? No. Unless you do it without a relationship, without the spirit. Right. If you're just trying, I'll prove to him I can do it. What have you proven? You're strong-minded and you're willing to go your own way, but have you proven your relationship? Kind of like the rich young ruler. 
How so? He kept all the laws. That's what he said. Yeah. Yeah, I've been booked. And what? what? Yeah, I've been booked. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. It's all about you then. Legalism is all about me. Yeah. And so keeping the letter of the law is really more about my showing off. Uh, they make their phylacteries long. And they insist on having the most prominent places. They do their alms in the street to be seen of men. They have their reward. Hmm. Abraham built altars everywhere he went. And when he came back, the people in the area, they knew that was Abraham's place, and they knew that was Abraham's God. That was a holy place to Abraham's God. He made an impact through his life, which was a life of obedience. But he wasn't obeying in order to receive the promise. He already had them. He was obeying because he loved the God who would make such outlandish, impossible promises. The God who had created everything from nothing. The God who could, by the breath of his mouth, imbue clay with life. Who could scatter the stars across the heavens and walk in the garden with his son and daughter. Wow. That's what we're trying to get our minds around as we enter into this book. It's the second giving of the law. It is these words. It is a reminder of what God has said and what God has done. And we are to learn from our family tree. Because Galatians says, if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wow, what an incredible place we are put. So what was the purpose of Israel? Deuteronomy. Oh, wouldn't you know, we'd find it in there. What is it, four? Verse 6. And then I'm going to back up and give some context for this. Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. What does it say? Who's reading that for me? Go ahead. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say... Surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Because what? What will make people know that we're wise and understanding? Because we do what God said to do. We are truly followers in close relationship. We do what our Father says. This is our family lineage. You can see why the parable of the uh, son who asked for his inheritance early would have upset the hearers of that parable. That's just wrong. And yet the father welcomes him back. Or how about this? Moabites, they're standing in Moab. They've been very nasty to Israel. And God says, 10 generations. And yet five generations later, we see the story of Ruth. Oh my. God says, I welcome with open arms anyone who comes to me in faith. You're not saved because of your blood. John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, you call yourselves sons of Abraham, but God's laid his ax to the root of that tree. Jesus said, if you were Abraham's descendants, you would live like he lived. But you don't. You're trying to kill me. Oh, my. What made the difference? Their phylacteries? 
their alms? Their heart. What is the Shema? I, I was supposed to say, what is Israel's role? It is to be obedient, to be a witness to the world. That's the first part. But Exodus 19, why did he call them out? Exodus 19, 4 to 8. Why did he, God deliver them from Egypt? Okay, because they would listen to him. Their history doesn't always prove that out, but <laughs> there's always a minority who do among these people. So why did he call them out? Because he was fulfilling his promise of the seed. But what does Exodus 19 say? To make them, yes. To make them a holy nation. What else? Okay, a kingdom of priests. Who's the head of the kingdom? It was a theocracy. God was the king. Everybody below that obeys the king. And what does a priest do? What is a priest's role? How does he fit in this community, in this family? Before God set aside the tribe of Levi to be a priestly tribe, every father of every family was a priest. They continued to be, but Levi's descendants now had the special responsibility of serving in the sanctuary. What is that role? What does a priest do? He intercedes. He ministers God's grace. He is the one who instructs. We see Ezra after the captivity having the people stand in the rebuilt temple's courtyard. Now, the whole thing's not rebuilt, but he has them stand there and he reads the entire law to them. And the Levites are throughout the crowd explaining it in Aramaic because they don't understand the Hebrew anymore. But the role of the priest is to be the teacher, the intercessor, the example which is why Jesus was so hard on the priests in his day. Oh, they taught the law. They made disciples who were seven times the son of hell. They'd travel over land and sea to win a single convert. But their example, that's why Jesus said, listen to what they say when they sit in Moses' seat, when they teach from the word, but don't follow their example. Don't do as they do. Have a heart relationship with God. And the Shema is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then what does it say? You shall love the Lord your God. Right? With what? All your heart and soul and mind and strength. You're to be consumed in this love. You're to be so intimately involved with him that his every word is your command and every one of his commands is a promise that's the setting for that book that we're about to get into that's why we have this preamble to help us go back to these words these roots to understand our role as his people unique peculiar in the world because we love and obey We are called to serve. We are called to lay down our lives that others might live, that they might know the one true God and Jesus Christ who came to save us, to be the yes to every one of God's promises given in the past. We're going to have a good time getting deep into this book, and we see it throughout this book, the reciprocal love of God and Israel back and forth. Uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 1, we read, they, they grumbled there and complained, and they were sent back into the wilderness, but God kept his promise and brought them back. God keeps his promise. Israel falls away. God loves them back. 
They show him love, and he does incredible things for them. We're going to see how he gives them the whole land. But they've got to make some choices. I'm getting ahead of the lesson. We're going to study more about this as we see the wonders of God's redeeming love each week and how it applies to our lives today and what we can do to let others know as his priests in his kingdom about the love of our Father in heaven. Time's up. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we have been blessed to spend this time examining again the wonders of these words. Lord, teach us to love you as you love us. Grant that we may show others the wonders of your redeeming love, that you may receive the glory and the honor now and forever. Amen.